Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Luke Bible Study with Pastor Robert. We hope that you dive deeply into Scripture as you draw nearer to God. Thanks for joining us, and have a great study. Hello, Zoomers. Anybody on Zoom? Oh, somebody's on Zoom. Good. Sorry, I had technical difficulties tonight, and Pastor Adam had to iron it all out for me. (laughs) Friends, we are in Luke 21. Here we go. And we've got an exciting uh, word of scripture before us tonight. So let's give our hearts attention to the reading of the word. And we are doing a shorter section tonight, just half the chapter. Please, uh, if your scripture is open, Luke 21. Let's read at verse 1 and uh, through 19. And then open us with a word of prayer. Thanks. Yes, sir. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them when you hear of wars and revolutions. Do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. (coughs) Father and God, we're grateful again for America and that you've foreseen to give us the truth. You called us and we responded and we're grateful. We ask that the Holy Spirit take over our thoughts and our hearts and our minds, grab onto something new and fresh, secure it inside, and then, of course, walk, uh, leave, and walk and talk more like you would want us to. And we ask that you will guide Robert's words and thoughts tonight. And, of course, pray in Jesus' holy and perfect name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, we are in the middle of uh, Holy Week tonight. <laughs> our own calendar, and the scripture that we have uh, in Luke 21 is the exact same day, the exact same day uh, in Holy Week. Jesus is speaking this Olivet Discourse, so we have half of it tonight and half of it um, next week, and it's called the Olivet Discourse because he spoke this to his disciples on the Mount of olives so this is one of the the greatest prophetic utterances of of jesus uh dealing with uh multiple um issues and and we'll uh enjoy time looking at that as well as uh old and other new testament texts so we'll start with the widow's might commonly understood or known the first little section of our text tonight the widow's might um, just to get our, our heart spiritual thinking, what biblical principles, question one, direct your giving? Well, when you give uh, to the Lord, what principles or scriptures, if you have any of them memorized or roughly, you know, where they come from, what <coughs> guides or directs your giving? 
as we think about this widow and her giving. Anybody? Okay, how does that direct your giving? Well, he gave 10%, and that seemed to become a, a well, I can't, I'm not sure if it became a standard, but he gave 10% to the, the uh, Pizadek after the, uh, they call it the slaughter of the kings. Okay, mm hmm Okay, great. Yep, that's very helpful. Yeah, Please. Only in Second Corinthians, yes, willingly and cheerfully, yes, uh, a cheerful giver, right? Not out of compulsion. That's very helpful. Please. I just often think about the fact that none of this stuff is mine. Didn't okay. Yeah, none of it's mine, right? It, it's all the Lord. So, um, you know, he, he deserves it all and he owns it all and he lets me handle uh, a little bit of it. That's very helpful. Who else, please? Um, just thinking about giving to meet others' needs so that God gets the praise. Okay. Yep. So God gets the glory. That's helpful. Please. Genesis, excuse me, 12 2. Uh, I am blessed and I am a blessing. Blessings go to me and through me. Okay. Yes. That's it's really. Not ours, like, <clears throat> like, like it's been said. Great. Yeah. Blessings that come to me and then can go through me to someone else. That's a great principle. Who else? Anyone else yet thinking about a principle of giving? I don't, I don't know the scripture, but I know that we're told to give to the Lord from the first part of what we get. Okay. So instead of waiting and seeing what's left at the end and what we can give to give first to God. Yeah. Great. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. And Paul said that the Christians gave not only their money, but they gave themselves first to the Lord. Yes. So they realize that they belong to the Lord and everything they have belongs to the Lord. Right, right. So uh, I think from Thessalonians, I think that one it might come from one of there too. So the Proverbs talks about the first fruits, the Old Testament. Uh, there's lots of giving principles that we have here. So here we see this uh, little scene, which actually is in contrast. Uh, the chapter division may not have been so helpful um, where we have it here, because the text we closed with last week, as you're looking at chapter uh, 20, at the end of it, is uh, Jesus warning, uh, you know, his disciples and, and the people who were hearing him uh, to beware of, of fake religious leaders. Uh, so just glancing at verses 45, 46, and 47, the close of chapter 20, um, you know, it's a show. Uh, they were walking around for a show. And they love, you know, greetings and honor that's given to them. And it's interesting. Verse 47, we just didn't explore that at all last week. These religious leaders are devouring widows' houses. What do you make of that? What, what were they doing? They Verse 47. What? Wanting them to do the tithes and offerings when they probably had barely to live on. Okay. But when it specifically says houses, what do you make of that? Religious leaders are devouring their houses. Taking them for taxes, maybe? Okay. Are they taking their houses away? See? Maybe loaning them money? I don't know. If yeah, saying. right. It's not explained. Were they loaning money and all of a sudden that the religious leaders become the deed holders of properties? You know, taking advantage of poor widows who had maybe no other children who would support them. And all of a sudden uh, they're short on cash. They can't pay quote unquote, pay the mortgage. And all of a sudden the religious leaders are cashing in. It, it's, it's disturbing. That is it, the, the self-centeredness of the religious leaders in that tiny section now is in contrast to the widow. She might've been somebody here at the beginning of the text who was a victim of false religious leaders in the last chapter. She's a victim of that. And you're, at least Jesus gives us uh, an example of her. And she's one of these silent uh, uh, saints in scripture. She doesn't say a word. Jesus just observes her and observes, you know, other folks who uh, have a great amount of wealth. And he makes some contrast here. So first of all, verse one, he observes that, that people were, the rich people were putting gifts into the temple treasury. Uh, you, you know what? Jesus is how many hours away from being nailed? How many? This is, holy this is Wednesday. So 
you're, you're, yeah, tw- you know, a little over 24 or so. He notices everything, brothers and sisters. His whole mind and heart is focused on the salvation plan. But you'd say something like this. Why is he bothering to give attention to observing people giving? Because that's what God does. <laughs> He, he sees everything and everything is seen by him, which is not only an accountability principle, you know, for us that he sees everything I do, but also an encouragement principle. Right. So here's this uh, uh, widow, but also the rich who are putting in the temple treasury. We, we know from Josephus and other early writers that the treasury, it, it wasn't like the plates we pass here in church. Uh, They had 13, in your notes, trumpet-shaped containers that were in the women's court. Do you see the little picture I gave you on your outlines for tonight? If you look at the bottom half of the picture, that's called the court of the women. So the big, tall building in the center of the picture in the background, that, of course, is the, the temple itself, the temple building. And right in front of that is kind of a Greek cross-shaped area where the court of the women was, and that's as far as women could go. Jewish men could go through that bronze gate that you see in this picture and go into the temple area as well as priests and so forth. But these trumpet-shaped collection boxes were in the court of the women. Now, if you use your magnifying glasses, you kind of see... In the side parts of the uh, cross-shaped area, there's some colonnades there, and that's likely in the area where these 13-shaped boxes were located. Now, in the Old Testament, in your notes, Moses uh, collected a half-shekel temple tax from everybody who was 20 years old or older. That includes everybody in the room here. We would have paid that to the temple annually, a half shekel tax and uh, that's from exodus 30 in your notes and that was for the repair and the upkeep of the temple that's how maintenance and uh, the support of the you know the the priests and so forth uh was was uh, taken care of so i left type on your notes so that you don't have to write all these things down there was specific uh reasons to put in each of the 13 collection boxes you notice them on your outline which of the 13 would you have put offerings into just skim them real quick which of the 13 might you have put offerings in if you were a jewish man or woman in the first century just glance at it real quick we won't take any more time than that but these boxes were the collection plates and when you went to the temple at least don't forget three times annually one of the times you paid the temple tax. So which of the 13? Just pull out one through 13 and say, yeah, I pro- my temple, you know, offerings would have gone here, there, or there. Anybody? If I was poor, I might need to pay the taxes. If I were poor, yes. I need to pay the taxes. Yes. What, which, which one would you have paid then? The one for the number two. Yes, if you were poor. And, of course, don't forget the mother of Jesus, the father of Jesus. That's what they paid. Joseph and Mary paid number two. Uh, That's where their money went in there because, uh, you know, when they, you know, uh, uh, brought Jesus, of course, to the temple uh, for that. Anyone else? Anything else stand out for you? But see, each one of them had a different purpose. Number 10. Number 10. Tax for women. Okay. Yes. The tax for women. So that one would have been one you would have put in. Um, and, and you see, you see various things, other things like wood for the altar and incense for the altar of incense. We don't think of those things. How did they get that stuff? It came from the offerings, of course, of God's people. Okay. So yeah, where did they get the wood to burn the animals on the burnt offering altar or the altar of incense? It came, of course, in this collection type of a system. Okay. Now, interesting Matthew chapter six, verse two, Jesus kind of uses a phrase in Matthew's uh, text that says, don't trumpet your giving. Um, the, the, the Greek Matthew used doesn't use the word trumpet, but it's likely Jesus was thinking about these trumpet shaped collection boxes. Likely the mouthpiece was the narrow end so that nobody could swipe. 
And the bottom was the bellow of the trumpet. And that's where the money, you know, collected. Sure, they had something to get it out with. I don't know what. Uh, but Jesus said, you know, be careful. You don't make your offering so everybody knows about it. Let it be between you and, and God himself, right? And John 8, 20 in your notes, I also gave you that text because it's interesting. One of the seven I am statements that Jesus made, I am the light of the world. John actually records that that I am statement was made when Jesus was near the place of offering, just as we're looking at it right now. He made it in the the court of the women there, where, of course, men and women would be there, uh, both. It wasn't just a a place for women. But so this offering place, of course, was noted several times in Scripture. So verse 2, the widow is poor, and she puts in two very small copper coins, Two very small. The Greek says she put in two lepta, um, a Greek word for the smallest coin that was available in the Jewish culture. It was worth about an eighth of a penny. That's what she put in. Two lepta. In the first century, uh, the Jewish people used both Greek and Roman coins. They circulated among the people, both of them. That's why the exchange occurred for the temple sacrifices, because they wouldn't accept, you know, Roman coins for that. You had to exchange that. And, of course, you know, there might have been tax or things like that. But Jewish currency was based on the shekel, the half shekel, the quarter shekel, and the lepton. Those were the four coins. Everything you dealt with was coins. You had no paper. You had no paper money. You had four types of coins, a full shekel, half shekel, quarter shekel, and these these lepton, which, you know, came really out of Greek and Roman culture. But, you know, the Jews adopted it as well, too. And Jesus, verse three, are you astounded? Verse three. In what Jesus says about her, I, I just it's astounding. Pick it out. What what is so magnificent about verse three? She put in more, more than all the rest. Well, the riches, you know, the rich folks are, are pouring in their coins. She puts in more in the terms of cost. You see, more. Not more in quantity of the money, in what it cost her, she put in more. Because she put in how much? She put in 100%. While the rest of the folks might have put in 2%, 10%. See, there's the contrast. Where's her wisdom? Oh... What, what a powerful example of faith. There might be some wisdom that would say, well, how about if I give God 50%? When have I ever done that? Because at least I've got something for a bite of bread. She was willing to risk it all for God. Oh, what a radical example of faith. I'll give it all up. There's something in her which says, I've got nothing to lose. What a powerful example of faith. While, of course, the contrast is with the other folks, you know, who out of their wealth. So verse four, the contrast. Make sure you see it in your text. It's laid out very uh, uh, parallel-like. Others are giving out of their wealth, the phrase out of their wealth, where she is giving out of her poverty. Do you see the contrast in verse four in your translation? You can give out of your wealth and there's no depletion of the wealth. But you can give out of the the poverty and, (laughs) and, and that's all she had to live on, which is exactly what the text indicates. It was all she had to live on. So question number two, what does, the question I combined just for space, what does their giving, the rich, what does their giving say 
or not say. Verse four, they're giving out of their wealth. What does it say? What is Jesus saying about them? What is he not saying about their giving? The wealthy. Start there. He's saying that they trust themselves for their own uh, livelihood. It, it, it certainly might be. It certainly might be. They're not sacrificing anything. That, in that sense, correct. There, there doesn't seem to be any sacrifice. It, it, it didn't cost them anything in the giving, please. It's not how much you give, but what you have left. You know what? There's a huge lesson in that, correct? Yeah. Great. Anyone else? What is it saying or not saying? They gave out of their wealth. Well, he's not condemning what they gave out of their wealth. I think that's important too. Because there are rich believers all over Holy Scripture. They're not condemned for being rich because guess where they got it from in the first place? I'm hoping some of those who gave out of their wealth were actually doing it from their heart. From their heart. So it, it, it's not necessarily a condemnation. Oh, all wealthy people are just plain selfish people and, you know, are no good. I mean, he doesn't say that, but we might draw that, you know, conclusion because, uh, he, well, you know, because then it's, well, then the application is if we draw that conclusion, all of you better give 100% this Sunday. Otherwise, you're no better than the rich. Do, do, do you see how that leads where it's like, uh, that really wasn't what Jesus was indicating at this point. I mean, Abraham, David, Solomon, I mean, wealthy people, God entrusts to whom he entrusts, right? And to whom much is given. But, I mean, th that's, that's upon all of us with what we have. And in comment or question on the wealthy part, Just out of their wealth. That the woman gave by faith. Because she was really trusting in God to provide for her. Yeah. And the wealthy didn't have to give by faith because they had enough that they could just trust in the wealth. I could, I could just go back home and make the shekel drawing out of my you know, little bag and go buy groceries. She couldn't do that. Yeah. And we don't hear about her after this. Isn't that interesting? It, you know, she doesn't say a word. Jesus doesn't quote her. He's just looking. And he sees more than you and I can see, right? He sees, Jesus can always see the heart and he can see the motive of our giving. And he can see where our giving is faithful. He can see where our giving is not faithful. He can see where our, our giving is sacrificial. He can see when our giving is out of our own riches. Maybe that's an encouragement to people who don't have a lot because they'll say, well, it's not good to be given anything because it's not going to be worth a lot. That's the second half of the question. So excellent. What does this say about her giving or not? And certainly, you know, in, in that sense, her faithfulness here is, is applauded and exalted and God can be trusted. An, an example I've heard of is a fellow that founded a college down in Texas in the Turner. Yeah. Oh. And, and he gave away more and more. Finally, he was giving away 90%. He designed a lot of highway equipment. Oh. The uh, road graders and such. Okay. And became wow. very rich and started wow. a Christian college now. Right. Training college. So it's so in. Three of our kids went. Yeah. Oh, three, three of the Wolfgang kids went to lift. Okay. Wow, oh, sweet. That's exciting. See, he, he doesn't say it's okay if you're poor to not give. There's no exemption in this either. That's why the question, what is he saying or not saying about her giving? Well, I understand you're really poor and you don't have much. You don't have to give. He's not saying that, is he? So again, it's not the amount that you have. I mean, the giving principle applied to her as much as applied to those who had a lot. Um, and she's not exempt from it. So it's, and then thus it's not the, the, the amount at this point, right? So you have a couple little pictures. I really don't know if those are exact pictures of, of Lepta or not. You know, I search the internet. I find what I find. Two little copper coins. But again, you know, so you got about a quarter of a penny is what she put in. I mean, roughly in our value system today. And Jesus, you know, uh, lifts her up as an example of, of just kind of self-abandonment, a devotion to God, which is willing to risk it all. And it's like, that's a, that's a cool thing. So it's not the size of the gift. 
Um, those who look blessed with, with financial resources, those who look blessed, what's the application? Sometimes they may not actually be blessed, right? Those who look blessed, those who have a lot of financial resources, uh, they may not necessarily be blessed because if they're trusting in their own you know, resources or wealth, <laughs> there's no blessing there. They're trying to strive after how to keep it. So, you know, don't judge a poor person for being poor. Don't judge a rich person for being rich. You know, it's only God who knows, uh, you know, the heart and the attitude um, of us, right? And, and my giving, though, is a reflection of my heart toward God, right? Store up your treasure in heaven. We've had that in Luke. My giving is reflective of my love and attitude toward God. So, you know, it's for all of us to review again um, and perhaps also guard against stinginess, <laughs> right? I don't know where exactly it is, but there's something about uh, they weren't supposed to take a, a widow's garments for pledging for her or something? Uh, it, in the Old Testament, yet yeah, it... Was that for... Uh, the, the Mosaic Law was uh, protecting... You know, widows in the case of, you know, if they, they, uh, I forget the immediate circumstances, but you were not to hold the widow's garment overnight because she needed it for personal warmth. So if this was uh, the, um, I can't think of the financial term, the security for something that she needed, she gave the cloak as security for, I will pay this. And, you know, she received whatever uh, she needed from that. that but the Mosaic years. law protected widows in that sense that you, you weren't to keep her garment overnight. You were to return it to her. Yeah. I think it was for people in general, not just women. Okay. Widows. Yeah. Widowers. Take, a a poor pledge. widower. Take a pledge. A pledge. Yeah, take yeah. Taking a coat in pledge. Give it back to the night yeah. Want. Right. <clears throat> God. Was, uh, yeah. In the New Testament, is there... Uh, such a uh, part that deals with uh, the management of these pledges toward the widows. There was something going wrong, and Paul was addressing that. He was? Anybody? That's not coming to mind. Well, the seven that, that, that Stephen was part of, that giving the problem between the, the uh, Greek women oh, and getting fed. The Greek widows, widows and, not and the Hebraic widows. Is that what you're thinking? Acts 6? Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So, all right, great. Any other thoughts or comments? We got to move on to our bigger section, the prophecy section tonight. Okay. So uh, part two, the destruction of Jerusalem verses five through 19, part two, um, just to, as we think of this and as you review the text, let your eyes, you know, linger where, we we are here. Why does Jerusalem suffer so much destruction repeatedly over biblical history? Why? Any, anybody thought of that? Here, Jesus, of course, is prophesying in the first century, in the 30s, that the city will be destroyed. He doesn't give the date, but we know it was only 40 years later. Why is Jerusalem beat up so much? I think, I think one reason is because uh, the world hates God's children. <laughs> yes. I have a scripture in my Bible somewhere that says Israel of God. Okay. And Israel is God's chosen land. Okay. And there's prophecy yet to be fulfilled yeah. there. And if the enemy destroys it, it will not be fulfilled. Yeah. So, and that's very true throughout all biblical history. Satan has been, you know, trying to, uh, you know, prevent, um, you know, the promises of God from Abrahamic and all the way on uh from coming true so and and jerusalem is not uh being done now what was it last night um some uh issues on the on the temple mount and the al aqsa mosque which is the second smaller mosque that's on the temple mount area and and jewish police had to go in there and it, it the weapons didn't <laughs> look good yeah it didn't look good the, the Jews could go in there and worship, but the Arabs like to cause havoc in there oh, now at this time. Because Passover. Because Passover week. Yeah. And then the um, <clears throat> Jewish police will have to stop that. Okay. And then the Arabs turn it around and say they're being harassed yeah, by the Jews. By the Jews, yeah. And it, it just was not a good thing, certainly. So... 
th- this uh, scripture that we have now is recorded in Matthew 24 and Mark 13. Those are the parallel texts. It's called the Olivet Discourse again. And in this uh, message uh, sermon that Jesus gives the Olivet Discourse, there are two related events that uh, are sandwiched together in these verses, both the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the world, the second coming of Christ and the, the end of the world. Two destructive events are sandwiched together in this prophetic text that we have before us. Uh, And Luke's text over Matthew and Mark gives the most details about Jerusalem's destruction. So uh, we're we're blessed to be able to read that. Uh, Another bullet in your notes, just under uh, Roman 2 then, uh, Luke's eschatology. Those of you who really uh, are, are cognizant of, you know, prophecy in Holy Scripture, Luke doesn't have a lot of sections of eschatology or, or, you know, that scripture, which relates to end times, but I listed them there for you. The parable of the watching servant we had in chapter 12, um, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem in chapter 13, saying your house will be desolate. That was already prophetic of the destruction of Jerusalem. Chapter 17, the second coming of Christ will be like lightning. We had that text And then chapter 19, most recently, again, the destruction of Jerusalem. So this is the scripture we look at tonight, and next week is the second half. I hope you can come for part two. So let's move to letter A on our outline, though, the setting of this message, this prophetic sermon, the setting in verses 5 and 6. Matthew tells us that Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives, so he's left the temple itself, you know, the, the, he saw the widow. That's the last account. The disciples left likely through the east gate, which is the one that's all blocked up and boarded up and bricked up now. He left there and he went down into the Kidron Valley and back up the Mount of Olives. There's a big valley between the Temple Mount and the Mount of Olives. And he's there and they're looking backwards. Those of you who have been to Israel, typically the tours take you to the Mount of Olives first so that you can look straight across at the Temple Mount. It is, it, it's just unmistakable. So imagine the little picture on your outline for tonight and you're on the next, you know, valley, Mount Morris, you know, away and you're looking at it like this. It wouldn't be as much of a down angle as the picture that you have here. You'd be looking almost directly across into the Temple Mount area. It's just magnificent uh, to be able to be there and to see that. Verse 5, the disciples note, look at this carefully, verse 5, the temple is adorned with beautiful, you might have the adjective, noble stones and gifts dedicated to God. Um, so the, the, the construction of the temple itself was so magnificent because of the size of its stones. And it was also slathered with, with white marble. Uh, we have that recorded by Josephus and other writers. So when you look at this, this is a little model, by the way. The picture is a model that you go to to become familiar with the whole Jerusalem setting and where things occur. It's a model So you'd see this exact same picture and it shows, you know, where the Temple Mount uh, is and was and and so forth. And you review, you know, uh, the space of the whole thing. And then you go in your walking tour of the old city of Jerusalem, typically. So that did I just turned off so that the um, look next at your note as I try to figure out how to maybe put some different batteries in here. Um, that the review of the temples or the sanctuaries of God that we have there. And I have, thank you, Pastor Adam. Um, so we, we want to review those. Thank you. Um, while we're thinking about the, the temple in the first century being destroyed, uh, let's just review quickly, see if that works. And if those turn back on. Uh, So I gave you seven notes, and I think I left all the typing for you there, too. So, again, you don't have to worry about jotting things down. But God has always invited his people to come together in worship in a particular dwelling place. He has biblically done that. So, number one, the first place was the tabernacle. 
the tent, which was movable. Man, can you imagine carrying that around for 40 years in the wilderness, guys? Ladies, you're, every pot, every altarpiece, every canopy, every covering, every board, every pillar was carried. I mean, yes, they might have had some donkeys with, you know, U-Haul trailers or something like that. And they set it up. And they took it down and they set it up and they took it down. So God bid them. He invited them to do that. Roughly the date of the, the, the construction of the first worship house, 1491. That's the same date classically given for the exodus from Egypt. Anyway, they built it shortly after getting into the wilderness because they went to Ace Hardware. <laughs> right? And they had all the supplies. No, that lasted about 500 years. They used the tabernacle about 500 years. Number two, then came the temple of Solomon. David wanted to build it. It was on David's heart, but he was a man of blood. So God said, I will not let you a warrior who fought all of the Israel's battles to get to the promised land. I won't let you build my house. So the temple was built by Solomon, 1 Kings 5 and 6. Roughly 1000 BC is when Solomon built it. And it was burned by whom? Roughly 500 years later. Burned by whom? Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, 586 BC. So from 1000 to 586, that structure lasted. And then it was burned. Jeremiah, I gave you the text. Number three. When the exiles came back from 70 years of captivity, they wept because there was no temple. But God ordained that they'd be sent back. And uh, the governor, Zerubbabel, uh, was the one who uh, led the construct construction of the temple again on its same foundation. So his date is there, roughly 515 B.C., that third structure if you i mean my accounting of it the tent is not called a structure particularly the tabernacle but they built this and of course that's ezra three through six and sadly there were some people who survived the whole 70 year captivity remembering what solomon's temple looked like and the grandness of it and when they saw zerubbabel's they said Low income housing. <laughs> they wept because it did not have the same. Well, they didn't have the money, the resources, or such. But uh, God received this structure, and you can read about that in Ezra 1 through 6. And the little prophet Haggai, uh, chapter 1 and 2, is all about Zerubbabel's temple. This temple lasts roughly 500 uh, 500 years until the time of Herod the Great number four so Herod the Great uh, is this you know Idumean part Jewish you know part uh, other ethnicity and not the favored of the Jews however he's the one who refinanced uh, on your backs of course the the enlargement of of the Temple Mount and the, the the reconstruction of the temple itself so that it had a greatness that was comparable to Solomon's. Uh, but he's the one who, who made the whole platform of the Temple Mount bigger and wider, which meant he had to build walls to hold up the flat platform because Mount Moriah originally wasn't all that big. So Herod the Great was the one who, who did that. That's the temple that Jesus, of course, worshipped. Uh, himself in where he saw the the givers uh, in the women's court and so forth so the little picture is you know a best artist drawing uh, that we have by the way there are no photographs from them <laughs> unfortunately <laughs> right now that temple of Herod the Great was burned again by Titus the Roman uh, general who became you know a Caesar in 70 AD Jesus will speak about it tonight in the text he won't say the date of course but the disciples who are so enthralled with the building because of its beauty, its grandeur, Jesus says, don't get hooked on it. Not one stone will be left on another. See? 
it's all going to be torn down. Number five, this is where it gets interesting because our best understanding from Holy Scripture is that even though there is no temple now in Jerusalem, the day is coming when the Antichrist will build it. Uh, he'll negotiate, at least somehow, we think, between the Jews and the Muslims for a temple to be rebuilt. We call it the Antichrist temple because he will create a peace, which is a false peace between Jews and Muslims, so that somehow a temple will be built in the future. We know this from Daniel 9 and Revelation 13. And then number six, that temple won't last. And finally, we get to the glory of the millennial temple, which we have from uh, Ezekiel in the Old Testament, 40 through 48. Also, Haggai chapter 2, verse 7, made mention of this millennial temple where Christ uh, himself will be worshipped and um, where Ezekiel, if you were with us a couple of years ago, uh, outlines how life will be like with this temple where Jesus himself is present physically, physically and ruling. And then number seven, number seven is not a physical temple at all, correct? In fact, scripture says in the eternal state, the new heavens and earth, there will be finally no physical building because the, the person's of God and Christ are the temple that we will worship for we will behold him with our own eyes. Right. And so the glory of number seven is not a structure. It's the, it's seeing God and is seeing Christ. So hallelujah, the day is coming. Right. So that's your quick rundown on temples. Does that help a little bit to gather a lot of biblical history? Anybody, a question or comment or please. Um, second Thessalonians two, four. Okay. The Antichrist sitting in the temple of saying that he is God. That's helpful. Second Thessalonians 2, 4. You can add that then to number 5 in your notes. Temp uh, temple number 5, the Antichrist temple. Second Thessalonians 2, 4. Paul, of course, prophesied and knew the Antichrist would be in a temple declaring himself to be God. By the way, that happens then in the middle of the tribulation. After the first three and a half years of the, the tribulation, you know, he pulls the rug out and says, by the way, yeah, worship me. So, and then things really get set into place. Anybody else on that? That's a lot of biblical history, but I thought it was appropriate at this text. They're marveling at the building renovated by Herod the Great. And Jesus says, don't marvel at it. It's going to be down. <laughs> and it's like, how can that happen? And did I see another hand or please? Did you say the tabernacle Roughly 500 years. The date's 1491 to 1000. That was at Shiloh, right? And they were yes. Even David. Yes. Yes. Even David did. Even Solomon did. I, I keep try. I track it through the history of Kings and it shows up in Kings. I can't remember the last chapter where I find it before it disappears from biblical history. So even during Solomon's time, the tabernacle at Shiloh, still existed, but obviously then it fell out of use because of the temple. So about 500 years. Yeah. So that covers a lot of worship in, in a short period of time. Is that when they moved the uh, Ark of the Covenant out of there? And, and yes, it. correct. I mean, and I can see why it fell out of favor. Correct. Like, I mean, Ark is moved out of what uses it. Then? Right. What uses it? I mean, it is a new era. Correct. So thanks for reminding us of that scripture. You know, and there was great celebration and there were there were sacrifices of oxen. I mean, I don't know how many thousand every feet they sacrificed a couple more or goats. I mean, it was just huge. You know, God has come to dwell with his people. It was a great time of celebration. Yeah. So verse six, here's the prophecy that we look at here carefully, please. Verse six, the time or the days are coming when not one stone will be left on another. Right. Which we've already had previously in Luke chapter 19, verse 44, Jesus is prophesying the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem itself under Titus, which happened in 70 AD. Now, this, this, of course, you understand, is a general description of the destruction. I mean, the temple being flattened itself. Today, we have a remnant of the Temple Mount, which is called what? Where the Jews worship. The Wailing Wall. Of course, see, that is part of Herod's support system to expand the platform of the temple that originally David built upon. The Wailing Wall is part of that expansion that Herod made. And that's the only part, of course, where the Jews 
have access to, uh, you know, in regular worship that the, the Temple Mount itself is, you know, controlled by the Muslims. But when you see the pictures this week on the news of the Jews praying there and sticking prayers into the cracks of these massive blocks that, you know, Herod had quarried and put in place there to make a bigger platform for the temple. So he expanded Zerubbabel's uh, platform and, of course, redid the whole building. I mean, it was quite an endeavor, and there certainly was a glory to it. Okay, so that, here's the prophecy. Not one stone will be left, but we, you know, the, so the Wailing Wall, you understand, is, is not a part of a building. The Wailing Wall was the support system. That's why it's still there. Uh, so when it says not one stone on another, it's the it's the temple complex itself and the buildings, you know, on it, uh, which, you know, Jesus was prophesying, of course. Now, it's interesting. The Gospels, the, our, our four Gospels, of course, never mentioned the destruction of Jerusalem itself or of the temple. And that's why we're really quite confident that all of their writing occurred before. The destruction. 78 AD. The gospel, this helps us date, you know, there's all kinds of debate on when the gospels were, but none of them made any reference to the destruction happening. So the, the, the gospels, it helps us date that a historical event occurred, you know, sometime later. Okay. Now, uh, this is where we get to Daniel's 77s, and, and this is an important connection. We're going to pause just to do a little bit of, of side work right here. Does anybody can, from your previous study, this is the worksheet that hopefully, you know, you picked up uh, our Zoom friends and everybody else. You've got a little chart on you. Those of you who have studied Daniel 9 previously, how, how does Daniel 9 address Christ's prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. I want to make sure we tie in strategic prophecy from the Old Testament with tonight. Does anybody know how does Daniel 9 address Christ's prophecy that not one stone will be left on another? They'll all come down. Anybody? Do you, do you know the connection between these two really powerful prophetic texts? It says in verse 26 that the prince said, will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay. Even Daniel, Daniel, back in the 6th century, middle to end of the 6th century B.C., receives these prophecies about the coming destruction of Jerusalem. But bear in mind, Daniel... Well, he was taken prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in the uh, early early part of the, the 6th century. I mean, he wasn't there. He was already hauled off to, to Babylon, 605, I think is our best understanding. He was one of the first uh, deportations along with the other wise men. And But he knows that the whole city of Jerusalem was destroyed in, in his lifetime. It was already destroyed. Now he's getting another prophecy about the city, which is currently destroyed in his lifetime being destroyed again, again. So the continuity of Holy Scripture, we're not going to spend a ton of time, but that's the worksheet if you'll pull out your Daniel 77s. This this is hugely prophetic. You, You know what's cool about this? Here's the short course. Daniel is reading in what Old Testament prophet when he discovers the length of the captivity of Babylon? Does anybody know? We just studied the book. Already, Holy Scripture, the prophet Jeremiah, the writings of Jeremiah are circulating already. I mean, Jeremiah, of course, is also part of the whole destruction of Jerusalem 586. Jeremiah is. He lived through it. And his writings are the first writings along with Isaiah earlier. I don't know if Daniel Daniel didn't have access to Isaiah scrolls or not, because Isaiah prophesied, you know, the destruction of Jerusalem and Cyrus sending people back a uh, hundred years earlier, but he doesn't mention that. So whether, uh, whether he had access to Isaiah scrolls or not, we, we don't know, but he mentions the current prophet, Jeremiah. And there he learned for the first time in captivity, that exile would be 70 years long, 70 years long. He learns it, and he learns it. Our best understanding is in the 530, you know, 9, 538, 537 type segment. So he 
minus 70 from 605, that means we are as close to getting out of captivity as we can ever get. Do you, do you see? Just do the math. Subtract 70 from 605. We're like almost out of here. Praise the Lord. So Daniel prays to God a prayer of repentance for the nation. Because Daniel also knows from Leviticus and other places in the Pentateuch that the restoration of God's people is dependent upon their humbleness and their broken hearts and their acknowledgement of sin. And then the famous uh, phrase of the prophets, God will restore their fortunes or bring them back out of captivity, back to the land that he promised them. Our best understanding is Daniel really believes that the millennial or messianic kingdom is going to begin as soon as the 70 years end. He thinks the Messiah is going to come when the captivity is over and we're going to walk back in and rebuild a new Jerusalem. And the angel of God comes and says, take a time out. Your chronology is wrong. Jerusalem will not be in the sixth century, the subject of the messianic or millennial kingdom. Your, your timing is way off. So the angel gives him a timetable of when he can anticipate the full restoration of the people of God and the nation of Israel. He gives Daniel, a timetable, and he calls it 77s. It's a play on words because Daniel has just learned that the captivity will end by Jeremiah's writing in how many, the totality of years? 70. And it's not, unfortunately, you know, King James continued to translate 70 weeks because then the whole thing had been over a whole long time ago. But the context determines these heptads are years, because Daniel has learned 70 years of captivity. And now the angel is going to give him a timetable of when God will restore Israel. That's the prophecy of Daniel 9. It happens. The bottom half of the chart is, is all we're going to look at now. It happens in three Time periods of seven. There's one seven sevens added to a 62 sevens added to a one seven gives you <coughs> 70 sevens. The first two segments of the 70 sevens are linked and joined without any indication that there's a time separation between them. The first 49 years and then the next large segment of 434 years are connected together without anything indicating the one has stopped and the next has begun. However, there is a separation between the 62 sevens and the final seven of the angelic prophecy. That's where I give you a little box called the present that's where we currently are in the timetable of the angel who came to speak to Daniel. We're in the present, which is often called the gap. The gap between the 62 sevens and the final seven. The final seven, of course, is the tribulation. The final seven years is going to be orchestrated when the Antichrist strikes a covenant, Isaiah 28, with the Jews to rebuild the temple. That's the trigger of the tribulation. So we know we're not in it yet because that event hasn't occurred with the Jewish people. So far, so good, all, all you prophecy folks. So now Daniel 9, verse 25 through verse 27 the verses are typed for you, and you've got some arrows. Hopefully, it makes sense. But here's the timetable as the angel speaks to Daniel. So Daniel 9.25, um, when the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, this is Daniel's Jerusalem. This is Daniel's Jerusalem. When the decree is issued by Cyrus that the Jews can go home after 70 years 
this is going to be a 49 year time period, which is, of course, already spent. Um, and and before the anointed one appears, now the appearing of the anointed one is who? Jesus. Jesus. That's why the second part of verse 25 is indented with the arrow to the right. And you see then the anointed one appearing. He appears during the second time period, the 62 sevens. And then the third part of verse 25, Jerusalem will be rebuilt with streets and a trench during times of trouble. Do you, do you remember reading the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, which discussed the rebuilding of the temple? How did the Jews have to act during the time of the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem in the, in the uh, late 6th century? How did they have to work? Yeah, in fact, can, can you describe it a little further? Do you remember further? They had to have a weapon. Yeah. There it is. A weapon and a tool. In one hand, they had to have a sword while their trowel is in the other hand. Because the opposition, that the wickedness of Satan and so forth, is in all the local people who do not want the Jews re-inhabiting the land again. They had to they had to live with this. And it's during times of trouble. You see? So that was prophesied already to Daniel. That's the conditions of the city of Jerusalem being rebuilt in the late 6th century. Does everybody, the, the, the seven sevens, the first time period, of course, happened during Daniel's lifetime. Okay. Well, the appearing of the anointed one. Now, some people take this as his incarnation. I don't. I, I take this as his entrance into Palm Sunday. That was his appearing, the appearing of the anointed one, because that appearing occurs late or at the end of the 62 sevens. A lot of history has already transpired. So uh, if you add 434 years plus four, who's got their phone out, plus 49 years, where are we at? We're at 534 years, are we not? So how much? What's the addition, please? No, 434 plus 49 puts you over 500. 30 plus 50 is 80. Okay. 39, 40, 34 are not going to add up to 100. Okay, what's the addition then? 400. Subtract that from 515 subtract that from 515 and where are we at what date are we at what date are we at then ad which is the time period for the death of christ the the years it's the time 30 to 32 is or 33 some people the dating of christ and his death the appearing of Christ, whether you say Palm Sunday, but, you know, five days later for Passover, you know, his appearing at the cross was dated by the angel. And so the first two time periods were already historically happened. So the math. So sorry about my math confusion there. But we're right at roughly 30 to 33 AD, which is when all of history records that Christ, you know, appeared and died. His, his three-year ministry. Okay. So then Daniel 9, 26, after these things occur, notice the word after in there is where we understand there's a gap in time. So Daniel 9, 26, after these things have occurred with the coming of Christ, the anointed one, the appearance to him, his rejection uh, by Israel. And uh, th- then we have six things that are noted for us in Daniel 9, 26. The anointed one will be cut off, which is what event? Crucifixion. He'll have nothing. He's even buried in a grave that is not his own. Number three, the people of the future ruler. See, the angel already is now looking past the uh, death of Christ. The people of the future ruler will come and destroy Jerusalem and the temple. There's your prophecy in Daniel's timetable already of the text we're looking at tonight do you see it so the romans are going to come in and destroy the temple the angel prophesied this to daniel so they already knew that a rebuilt jerusalem was going to be destroyed again and then the end was going to come like a flood 
that's the Old Testament word picture for an invasion. A flood is an invasion by a foreign people who come in, pour in to the land, which is the Romans who came in and destroyed the city. Uh, a war continues to the end. Number six, desolations are decreed. That's an interesting Old Testament word. My personal opinion, which can be wrong in a lot of things like my math, is that number six in Daniel 9.26 points to the uh, seals, trumpets, and bowls of Revelation. That's my own opinion. I think it fits. So thus I drew the arrow from number five and number six uh, under the the Daniel 9.27 verse. So we're in the gap time period of which we don't know how long the gap is before the final seven begins. The final seven years of the prophecy before it begins triggered by the peace covenant the Antichrist makes somehow with the Jewish people to rebuild the temple. So then Daniel 9.27, he, this he, this future ruler, is going to confirm a peace covenant with many. And number two is in parentheses because Daniel doesn't indicate the words that he'll rebuild the temple. But number three in Daniel 9.27 indicates there'll be a temple. Because if sacrifice and offering are occurring, Thus, there has to be a temple for it to occur in. That's the only place that scripture allowed for sacrifices to occur in a temple. So Daniel 9.27 assumes the Antichrist is going to negotiate how to get a Jewish temple rebuilt. And that's coming. That's that's coming. It could be in our lifetimes. Yeah, they've got it all pre, we say pre back. Yes, it, all the, the articles have been created. Um, and they're training the priests right now. Pre- priests are being trained. Levitic, the, the, the tracing of Levitical lines has been established by the Jewish people, so they're anticipating it. But number four, the abomination that causes desolation. The Antichrist says, worship me. You know, Revel- uh, Revelation 13, he has his sidekick, the false prophet, who can smoke people with his eyes and with his mouth, Revelation 13. Um, And then the end that is decreed for Antichrist. So here we've connected a massive part of Old Testament prophecy with tonight. We're back to Luke about any, any comments or questions at that point? That was just a quickie tour, right? Did, did we lose anybody in prophecy in a certain century? Anybody? Maybe that's hopefully a review, you know, of of some important scriptures we've done some years ago. So anyway, the the question number four that we've addressed, um, how did the two connect? There's a 490 year calendar for the uh, times of the Gentiles to the Gentile domination of Israel. 490 years when you add 70, 77, 490 years, but. The time is longer than that because we're in the gap of which the gap years aren't included in the timetable. Okay. Um, But we're already finished with uh, the um, 483 years. We're finished with the first two time periods. Wouldn't you say that this gap is the time that God is getting the Gentiles in? Um, the, 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 the The whole timetable is the times of the Gentiles. He's been drawing Gentiles in since Daniel's destruction. The whole event is the time of the Gentiles. Because, because you know, uh, Babylon is Gentile domination. Medo-Persia is Gentile domination. Greece is Gentile domination. Rome is Gentile domination. And Israel has never, you know, ru- ruled themselves. Correct. So the whole time period, please. Uh, the gap referred to as the church age then. Oh, sure. Church age. Except that that would only be from, uh, from Pentecost. Pentecost yeah. So next week's text uses the times of the Gentiles. That's where Jesus coined the phrase in next week's text, which again, I, I apply to the entire time chart. Since Babylonian domination, of course, you could go back to Assyrian, Assyrian domination as well, too. Yeah. yeah. Right. They never had another case. They never, right. They never ruled themselves. No, never. Captivity. Right. As a theocracy, yeah, Israel has never ruled. And <laughs> yeah, pray for the peace of Israel. Right. Well, let's keep going on from there. So, this, this prophecy gave us uh, that timetable. It's a prophecy of a rebuilt uh, Jerusalem in Daniel's day in the sixth century. 
Daniel is a prophecy of Christ's first coming. Daniel 9 is a prophecy of Christ's death. Daniel 9 is a prophecy of Jerusalem's destruction again in 70 AD. Daniel 9 is a prophecy of the Antichrist coming and that he's the trigger uh, for the tribulation the last seven years. So um, the prophecy of the abomination of desolation in a rebuilt temple and um, and the Antichrist demise in the end. Can I ask a question? Please. Where are you right now in the outline? The letter B. Yeah. So let's look at that uh, a little briefly there in verse seven. So all of that was the temples coming down. Those pretty stones, that beautiful marble, it's all coming down. And we're at verse seven in, in your text, but letter B in, in your outline. So the disciples asked two questions. When, the first question is, when will these things occur? When is the temple going to be destroyed? Jesus didn't give the exact date for that, did he? When will that happen? And then secondly, what will be the sign that these things are about to take place? So verse seven asks two questions, a when question and a what question what will indicate that it's coming we'd all like to know that wouldn't we now the other texts matthew and mark i just gave you marks and i think i left it typed in full there um, matthew 24 verse 3 there three questions are asked luke only indicates you know two questions being asked and the information from matthew's text does give us a little bit of help in Matthew, they ask three questions. First, the when question, which is the exact same thing as Luke. When will these things take place? When will the temple be destroyed? They'd all like to know. Inquiring minds would like to know. Number two, what is the sign of the parousia? This is the, 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 the Greek word for the coming, the second coming of Christ. That's what they used. When is your second coming? Notice that in a Jewish mind, the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming of Christ are linked together all the time. Daniel was absolutely certain that with the destruction of the city, with getting out of captivity, that that Messiah would come and rebuild the Messianic kingdom of Israel. He was absolutely convinced, but he was wrong. So the disciples have the exact same thing on their mind. Anytime that Jerusalem is destroyed, that means in their minds, the next thing that happens is the Messiah comes and restores. That's why the questions are significant. Yeah. So when is the city going to be destroyed? Because that for us means that the Messiah is coming right after it to rescue us and save us. However, their timetable is wrong. <laughs> after it was destroyed, there was no Messiah that came. And now we're in the gap. We're in the church age gap of which we've been waiting 2,000 years for the Messiah to return and restore everything to Israel and for Jesus to live as king, you see? So th they're, they're processing the same thing that Daniel did, that after the destruction of Jerusalem, when God punishes his people, then he restores his people. And now we're in the 2,000-year gap where the people have not been restored. I mean, in part, you can argue 1948, in part, but... Uh, they don't own the whole land, and they certainly don't own the Temple Mount. They don't have a temple. See, the prophecies, part of Daniel 9, is still not fulfilled. Neither is parts of uh, Luke 21 tonight, okay? So th there, Matthew's questions help us understand the two questions of Luke. When will the temple be destroyed, and when are you coming back? When is the Messiah coming back to restore all things? Those are the two questions, the when and the what, Okay. Now, which of the two questions did Jesus address first? Question five. Which of the two did he address first? The what? He addresses the second question first. But keep in mind, the, the, the what will indicate that it's coming may be what's before 70 AD or what's before the second, second coming. In other words, still in our future. The what's are going to cover the whole time period from the disciples in the first century to our present. So we're looking at signs now as we move into the text that are still occurring. 
And Luke indicates by Jesus' words, though, that, folks, if you see wars and rumors of wars, that's not an indication that Christ is coming immediately next. Luke is very careful to, to, to give us Christ's words to say, folks, that's just what Matthew says, the beginning of birth pains, right? The beginning of labor pains. I remember my mom telling stories of labor pains, you know, with with uh, my three older brothers, you know, and there were all the false signs of it. She's there a day early and goes home and she comes back another day and goes home. Some of you might have that. The beginning, all of these things that we see now in this text are just the beginning. It is not the immediate indicator of the second coming of Christ and the restoration of Jerusalem. It's just stuff that's going to be ongoing in the gap time period. Ongoing, okay? So uh, question number six, let's discuss initial fulfillment of these signs to date. Let's discuss that together. We're going to do it out loud together. Okay. We'll skip the table designations, which might've been helpful at some point. Have then, have there been false claims of people saying I'm Jesus that you're aware of to date? Are you aware? Now this is where I'm hoping many of you get your phones out and start typing in. Get, get us some current information. You got phones that can access the internet, correct? <laughs> Type in false Christ 2023. Let, let's get some info. If you're not aware of any right now, are there people claiming to be Christ right now? Yeah, right now. I mean, because we can say, yeah, uh, J- Jim whatever in, in, in Neville, Neville's Guyana, Jim Jones and Neville's I mean we can say that and it's like yeah he was a false Christ of course but he's dead he drank the orange he drank the Kool-Aid right but what about now folks who's, who's coming up with something see this is where you know is this is this prophecy correct that there's current false Christs that are going on uh, right now Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Did you find anything else? In 2022. That's what we're saying. Yeah. That'll that'll cost you prayer time at 5 a.m. tomorrow morning. (laughs) 5 a.m. Yeah. Yeah, don't forget to pray for your elected leaders, even the ones you didn't vote for yesterday. Pray for them because they're God's ordination and God's providence. I know. Yeah. Ha- have you come up with something? I-, I see only a couple phones working. I thought this was a total cell phone church. There's a whole list of probably. Can, can, can you give us one current one in just a circumstance or where he is at? So Gabby Hanna, Bruce. Born in 1991, an American internet personality and singer-songwriter went on a multi-post rant on TikTok in August of 2022, claiming to be the second coming of Jesus. There. So that, but there's a bunch. Yes, there's a bunch. I found that exact same one, by the way, when I searched at home on my old desktop. Do, do you have another one? Yeah, one in Russia. In Russia, okay. Claim to be a reincarnation of Jesus, and he's watching over us from orbit. That's okay, from orbit, he's watching over us, folks. I mean, see, it doesn't hit the news, it doesn't hit the airways and much until a compound in Waco, Texas, is held hostage and burned down. You know, but th- they're all over. People are doing this all the time, right? The false claims that I'm Christ and the second coming is here. I mean, your phones. Are, do you have another to quote well, there, Pastor? Todd uh, Kincannon, uh, born I'm, 1981, former head of the South Carolina Republican Party, great. <laughs> was arrested in 2018 for killing and mutilating his mother's dog. I read this. He, he claimed police that he was the second coming of Jesus Christ and that God had told him to do it because every thousand years there needs to be a sacrifice of blood must be spilled. There. How current is that? Right. Have you got one, Jeff? A guy in Brazil. Okay. Brazil. He goes by uh, Jesus Nazareth Rex, or I N R I, 
which are the, oh. the are what was inscribed by, uh, yeah on the sign above Jesus Christ thing the sign yeah he had his awakening in 1979 he says he is the Messiah and he's in Brazil okay. from Australia all right also known as AJ Allen John Miller lives in Queensland Australia with his partner Mary Love Miller claims that he remembers details from his former life as Jesus. And Love says that she is the reincarnation of Mary. Oh, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Yeah, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene. Okay. <laughs> Folks versus. <She's> out of <laughs> verses 9 and 10. So we know the false claims Jesus says, get used to it and don't jump at it. See, he's warning. Don't jump at it because it's going to be everywhere. Uh, verses 9 and 10. There'll be national chaos. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Can you talk with me about current fulfillment of that part of the prophecy? Ukrainian war, Ukrainian war and Russia's gobbling of another country illegally, right? Where where else? Israel. Okay. China and, and Taiwan and that issue. See, ongoing folks. India and China are right at each other. India and China? Also, okay, <laughs> yes, turmoil and chaos, Afghanistan, and, and the decline of that, you know, after our exodus, the chaos, Jesus says, those things are not indicators of his second coming. Those are just common things that will occur in this gap age before Christ comes to, to uh, deliver his people, right? So 9 and 10. How about we go to verse 11? Global disasters, verse 11. How is that currently fulfilled in your day? Global disasters. Earthquakes in Turkey. And other Earthquakes in Turkey. The Indonesian tsunami back in 2000. Tornadoes. Yes. Volcanoes. Volcanoes. Wildfire. Let, let's list this all in California. First, California has drought. Secondly, they have wildfires. Now they have a deluge of snow and water. Do you, do, these are all things currently fulfilling what Jesus is saying versus global disasters. <laughs> okay. This, here's, the, uh, here's the map of uh, earthquakes. This one, you know, wasn't dated real soon to 2017. It's interesting, the 1040 window that, that gets a ton of the earthquakes. So all, all of the colors indicate uh, earthquakes that have occurred just in the span of, of uh, our century. And this, this was the Turkey, this was the Turkey um, earthquake. Yes, Turkey and Syria, nobody Right, and Syria. Turkey and Syria. And the, the dead in, in Turkey and Syria, is that around 60,000? There's a million affected by it, but dead 60,000 and injured. I forget how many thousand. Um, anything else with verse 11? Earthquakes, famines, famines anywhere. Is there any food problem in the world currently? Do you know because of Russia's invasion that that has disrupted the whole food chain thing for, for much of the world that th those who are starving, uh, children and adults, um, I, I, I read that one in 10 people in the world go to bed hungry every night. One in 10. Yep. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, I mean, just think of this staggering number in this room. The, the issue, the term now, food insecurity, you know, and, and the government boxed food, you know, during COVID. And then when that w went away, all of a sudden there was a new tragedy because, the, yes, there were people dependent on food boxes. Now they don't have it. Um, but that that is uh, uh, um, being fulfilled, right? Uh, 149 million children are chronically malnourished. 3.1 million children die annually from undernutrition. Children annually um and conflict is the number one uh issue in the world that drives hunger so because of wars and nations and kingdoms and conflict that's what drives hunger up when conflict in the world goes up you can't go in there and help them because the political situation is so yeah. bad you can't they, they use these 
the situation for their political change, whatever yes. the may be. Right. The issues. Right. Yeah. Um, fearful events, verse 11. Have you experienced fearful events right now in your lifetime? Fearful events. Yeah. Verse 11. Yeah. Okay. Shootings. 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 Uh, January 6th. The recent one in um, um, Nashville. Yeah. Uh, that was yes. That was fine. Yeah, that was okay. It was yeah. okay. That was that an was insurrection. Really bad, but they yeah. That was a real insurrection. Um, the, you know, the whole issue of, you know, policing and George Floyd, and I don't know how many of the other names, you know, I mean, those, those are just fearful because, you know, is it safe to be policed? And, you know, do we want to, it's fearful. Will, will social chaos become the norm and you'll call 911, but nobody's going to come. I just heard that the LA mayor has now has said that Anybody in LA of color who commits murder, rape, or robbery will not be charged. Okay. Wow. So then even if murder, rape, even or robbery. If a white person wanted something done, they could get a, a person of color to do it. They're, that's anarchy. That's that's anarchy. Terrible. Yeah. I think we're becoming I, a banana republic. Yeah. 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 We're turning into it. Yeah. Yeah. Are we are. Yeah. Now, the last part of verse 11, great signs in the heavens. And for us, typically, I think we are taught pretty much to kind of look at shooting stars or planets in orbit or out of orbit. And I'd say I'm not sure if you Google right now, great signs from the heavens. Everything I Googled, you know, it just points to the other scriptures of the second coming of Christ, the, the moon going blood red, you know, the the sun and the stars and so forth. But I only read one person who said, you know what? The great signs in heaven you're experiencing right now is weather. W E A T H E R. That is a sign. If you don't look at what is going on in California or tornadoes that are ripping the land apart and such that those are great signs. See when every Jew lived under that understanding that weather was under God's control and dictation. And when God's people were not responsive to him, there was destruction via great signs, which was, you know, in removing of rain and then drought comes and loss of food and so forth. God controlled that. (laughs) Okay. So, you know, when you say great signs, you know, you're looking for the moon that turned blood red and, And you're going, oh, that one's not fulfilled yet. It's being fulfilled every day with with weather. God is in charge of every raindrop, snowdrop, and every wind. He's in charge of every bit of it. So uh, now when you look at the backside of your document, um, the backside of it, I'm just making a quick connection now. The uh, document, which is the Olivet Discourse, the Olivet Discourse of the Revelation Seals, the, the, the correlation, so please, there are one, two, three, four, five columns on the document. Please just look at the center column. The third and the fourth columns show the continuity of what life is going to be like even when the tribulation begins. So uh, look at the center column uh, from top down, Luke 21, verse 8, false Christ's. Revelation seal number one says there's going to be a false peace that is coming on the world when the tribulation begins. Luke 21, 9, there's war. The second seal in Revelation 6 is war. The third item in Luke 21, verse 11, earthquakes. And there you see a discontinuity with famine, although earthquakes could you know, cut off an awful lot of supply chain. And then notice famine, the fourth item Luke gives, is the third item or the third seal of Revelation. So, you know, maybe earthquakes and death, you know, show continuity from Luke to Revelation. But you can go all the way down the list there and see, by the way, we are not in the revelation seals we are not these are all precursors everything we're experiencing now is precursor the antichrist has not come he has not established the peace with israel therefore we are not in the revelation seals but the events of revelation which we are having a foretaste of now will be accelerated later accelerated later okay but you see the continuity of bible prophecy 
Uh, now we've gone from Daniel to first century and from first century, you know, into our future with, with that little charter document. Does that raise any quickie questions for anyone on that one? I think that one made sense. Everybody's probably seen that correlation before. Jesus is prophesying things that will occur all the way up to his second coming. And, and we're in the precursor, of course, time period. Okay, we have just one section to finish yet then as uh, we look at um, the, the uh, final um, verses um, that we have there. And I had one sheet there. I must have flipped it or lost it somewhere. So we're looking then at the um, expected acts of uh, persecution and then the expected acts of divine providence. So now, yeah, on your notes, we're at a letter C, um, persecution and, and what will happen. So as you look at, at the four things that Luke outlines, uh, expected acts of persecution, namely, uh, people will arrest you, number one, persecute you, uh, number two, a betrayal of family members, number three, uh, some will die, and number four, hatred. Uh, people hating who you are. Um, which of those four most concerns you as we catapult toward the end? Which of those four things of persecution most concerns you? Okay, we're at letter C. Do you see expected acts of persecution? Do you see that? And then one through four. So just glance at one through four. Which of those four most concerns you? Because this, these are things occurring but also will occur as we go on. Go ahead, please. Was it somebody was saying something? Over betrayal. Here. betrayal. Okay, the betrayal. Your own children. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Who turn that turn against you? Already happening. happening. Yeah. Indoctrinating their children in school. In schools. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Anybody else? One. Number one, and how? The, the, yeah. Are standing up for Christ, they're going to basically <laughs> come and start to say, "No, you can't do that." Okay, and, 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 and right, lay hands on you and persecute you just because you're saying you're a Christian. Sure, that is, yeah. that is definitely well. It's going to happen. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, right. right. Please. The death part too. It's, uh, it's just a suicide, and uh, just okay. People down in Canada, the teenagers that don't want to live, they just. Doesn't die now. Yeah, they just can go to a clinic and yeah. get her done. Okay. So these are current things um, we need to be aware. Of. But the last thing as we close, brothers and sisters, huh? so I organize this differently. Then now look at the last item, then expected acts of divine providence. Do, do you see how I coupled, you know, these scriptures and I, you know, I separated them for the sake of, of seeing them all together? Yes. We, we are being told by Jesus to expect acts of persecution. We are. Uh, hold, hold on to your shorts. It's here. It's not that it's coming. It's already here. But also, what is also here as we close, expected acts of divine providence. I listed five for you. Which one blesses you most tonight of the five? Please skim those. because that three. Number three. God promises to give you words and wisdom. Do you, you know what he's, he's drawing from an Old Testament scripture when he says that, when Jesus says that? Who, who is the original one who stuttered and didn't know what to say? Yes. Yes, folks. God is still promising to his disciples and to us my spirit will give you. you. You don't have to be a minister. You don't have to be uh, a, a speech person. You don't because I'm going to give you what to say and nobody will be able to counter you. The wisdom of God, the words of God at the right time of God. If, if we, any of us are in that situation of being arrested or persecuted, there's the promise of God. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. Who else of, of the five, which one, please? The protection because I'm alone. And okay. I value that. Yes. Now see, number four is interesting because the scripture there says not one hair on your head is going to be 
uh, parish, not one hair on your head. But it's interesting if you go back one, uh, two verses, some people of you are going to be put to death. Some of you, some of us will lose our lives for Christ's sake. Some of us will. But then verse 18, but not a hair on your head will perish. Well, all of a sudden it seems contradictory. Okay. Well, to die is gain. And, and the best people I read on that said, you know what? Yeah. It's not that you've saved your wig in the coffin or in the casket. It's that there is a guaranteed transmission into the presence of God, that there is a spiritual security that God gives you. It's in the salvation of Christ. So in that sense, you are divinely protected. Let him take your life. Let him take the top of your head whatever it might be, you know, I mean, don't, you know, we're, we will not deny Christ, but in that sense, there's a divine protection. I think that's a cool promise. One more, please. I used to worry about being persecuted because I thought maybe I won't be able to stand it. Yeah. yeah. But um, I came to realize what first Peter 4, 19 means, let them that suffer according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls to God as a faithful creator. So I'm not going to keep myself. God is going to keep you. Yeah. Yes, that's his promise, right? You are kept in the hand of God. You are already safe and secure in his hands. So come what may. Jesus wants us in that sense uh, to, quote, unquote, live recklessly for him. Because there, there's nothing the world can do. There's nothing the world can do. Um, we're safe in his hands. So, friends, take home that encouragement and comfort. His divine providence is guaranteed. God will not fail you. He will not fail you. So, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you uh, for this introduction we've had in your precious word, this very important prophecy that you gave your disciples in the first century. And here we are, Lord, uh, 2,000 years later, and we're still reading this prophecy and seeing it being fulfilled. And God, we, we know we're ever much closer uh, to the last days than your disciples were. And we pray the strength of Christ within us, not our self-strength or self-determination, not our wisdom, Lord, but you within us, your strength, your words. You, you are going to bear us up in the worst of circumstances to be able to witness the name of Jesus in these last days to speak him with great joy and with great expectation, no matter how this life ends. God, we're so grateful for this precious scripture. And we pray as we go tonight, you would grant us your spirit to process these things that we've heard and, and read in your precious book that we take them to heart and that your, your providential protection, God, it just carries us. Uh, throughout this week. Lord, we are humbled in the in this holy week. We are humbled as we have the privilege again to look at, at how the world massively treated you so wrongly. And yet it was your will, O oh Father, to crush your son. And you crushed him with my sin. You crushed him with the world's sin. And Christ, you bore that without speaking violently or against the world. You took that for our sakes, and we are humbled, and we marvel at it. Give us clear eyes to see your cross again in a powerful way this week. May we bear that cross in our eyes always and on our hearts as we live and move and walk for you, O Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.